Mark chapter 5, verse 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me. And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. I was conducting a revival meeting in the First Assembly of God in Phoenix, Arizona, the latter part of the month of November 1953, and the first part of, the, of December. I was staying in the home there are some friends who asked the pastor if they might uh, keep me in the home, and so uh, he agreed if it was all right with me, and so I stayed in their home. And after this Friday night service, they had uh, invited their children to come in for a little time of fellowship and time of refreshment. And so on this particular Friday night, just about the time they were ready to serve the refreshments, I had an urge by the Spirit of God to pray. It just seemed like a, an unduly prompting, more so than usual. I said to our host, they were all full gospel people, and I said to him, I, I have to pray, I must pray, and I've got to pray now. Well, he said, let's just all pray then. And so they just stopped whatever they were doing, and we went to prayer. Well, my knees hadn't hardly touched the floor, actually, till I was in the Spirit. Do you know what it means to be in the Spirit? Well, John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and uh, he tells us what he saw, as is recorded there in the book of Revelation. Paul said, you remember, in Acts, the 18th chapter, the ninth verse, that uh, the Lord spake to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. Then again the word of God said in Acts 23rd chapter the 11th verse, That the night following the Lord stood by him, and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Then in Acts the 22nd chapter, the 17th and 18th verse, it says, And it came to pass, Paul is speaking, he said, And it came to pass, when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And I saw him saying unto me, Make haste, and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And so if they had experiences like that in the early church, well, we have the same Holy Ghost. We ought to expect a few experiences at least now in the church. Praise God. And I know I began to pray with tongues by the time my knees had touched the floor. I, I was in the Spirit, or we could also say in a trance. That doesn't mean that you don't know what you're doing or you're unconscious, but it means that your physical senses are more or less suspended. At the moment... I didn't know where I was. I, would, I didn't know I was in Phoenix, Arizona, or even kneeling there. It just seemed to me like I knelt down in a white cloud. And I began to pray in tongues. I prayed just about as hard and fast 
with groanings as I could pray for 45 minutes in other tongues. Well, I prayed enough in the Spirit to know that I was interceding for someone who is lost. But on this particular night, at the end of that time of prayer, I had a note of victory, and I encourage folks when you're praying in the Spirit, that's with tongues, well, you just keep on praying that way until you have a note of victory. What do you mean a note of victory? Well, either laugh in the Spirit or sing a song or a song. Praise God. That means then whatever it is you're praying about, you've got the answer. And so I, I, I had a vision then. I saw our service on Sunday night. And between five and six hundred people present. Now this is Friday night. See, and God was just giving me a preview of the service on the coming Sunday night. I saw myself preach in that vision. And after I'd preached when I finished my sermon and was given the altar call. I saw myself sort of put one elbow on the pulpit and lean over the pulpit and point to a man who was seated on the second row of seats from the front in the center section. And I said to him, my friend, the Lord shows me that you are past 70 years of age and that you are not a Christian and that you do not believe that there is a hell, that you have been raised to believe that there is no hell. But God told me to tell you that you've got one foot in hell now and the other slipping in. And in the vision, I saw him come out from between the seats and come and kneel in the altar and gloriously say. Now afterwards, after it was all over, the folks present knew that I had seen something. They asked me about it, so I told them. And so uh, on Sunday night then, when we came to church, I came in through a side door about the time they used to turn the service to me. And I looked immediately to that spot, and there sat my man. I'd never seen him before in my life. But I had described how he was dressed, and brother and sister Fisher and their sons-in-law and daughters uh, said they already had him spotted. He was there just like I saw him, dressed just like I said he'd be dressed. And I preached my sermon, and when I finished my sermon, I leaned over the pulpit and did exactly what I saw myself do in the vision, and the man came and was saved. You know, he said to Brother Shores, that this, this preacher pointed to me, he said, you know, that preacher told me that I was past 70, I'm 72. He told me that I wasn't a Christian. He told me that I'd been raised by parents and been raised to believe that there was not a hell. He said, my parents were universalists, and they taught me there was no hell. And he said, they, he told me that I had God told him to tell me I had one foot in hell and the other was slipping in. I knew what he meant because he said I've had a serious heart condition. And the doctors had said that I may just die at any minute and one time they thought I was dead. And he said, you know, this is the first time I've ever been inside of a church building in my lifetime. <laughs> now you see, friends, no one knew to pray for that man. Not a more person of that church and knew him. He had come there five months before and bought a motel there in Phoenix. But some folks traveling from back in the eastern part of the United States had stayed in his motel, witnessed to him, and came out to the service Sunday night, and he said almost drug him out there. And he got saved. Well, the Holy Ghost knew he was coming, and we had him already prayed up and through and over, praise God, before he got there. Hallelujah. That's the joy and the benefit of praying in the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Now what I started to tell you was this, after that vision, after that vision, and I wanted to go ahead and explain to you that it came to pass just as I saw it, and just as I told these witnesses, they were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight people I told, and they all saw it come to pass, and then the Lord Jesus himself appeared to me, and he began to talk to me about my ministry, he began to talk to me about some things, nationally speaking, even concerning our own government that came to pass the very next year. And then he talked to me about some financial matters concerning my own life that came to pass just like he said they would. And then he said to me, my son, he said, be faithful and fulfill thy ministry for the time is short. Well, somebody said it must not be very short. That was ten years ago. You have to remember that time with God and time with men are two different things entirely. And so I said to him, Dear Lord Jesus, before you go, 
may I ask you a question, please? And he said, you may. Oh, I've thought of a thousand things since then but it, uh, that I might ask him, but at a time like that, you just don't think of it. And, and I said, dear Lord, I have uh, two sermons that I preach concerning the woman with the issue of blood, as is recorded in Mark 5, who touched your clothes when you were on the earth and was healed. And every time I preach those sermons, I receive both of them by inspiration, not by study. I believe in studying the Word of God said to study. Uh, but uh, I, I was driving my car down the highway, going to church, singing in tongues. When I got one of the sermons, I pulled over behind, beside the road and, and wrote down the sermon outline. And then I was preaching that sermon down in the state of Alabama and had already read the text of the scripture and, and, and uh, begun the sermon. And I, I, for I looked out at my Bible and suddenly, I've never had it to happen before or since, but suddenly one of those verses of scripture stood up on the page. It looked like it was about three times bigger print than the rest of it. It just stood up there and I saw something I never saw before so I took off on that sermon. <laughs> Amen. And so I said every time I preach those two sermons, I seem uh, to be conscious in my spirit to, to have the sense within me that the Holy Spirit is yet trying to get another message over to me, um, another sermon, a sermon that will more or less complement these two sermons. And I said then, at times of prayer, you know there are times when we pray that we just seem to be closer to the Lord at other times more conscious of his presence and so on and a greater anointing to pray just like we have a greater anointing to preach at times or a greater anointing to sing at times or a greater anointing to witness at times and at the times of greater anointing to pray I said again and again I've just come to the place that it seemed like I was just going to receive that message into my spirit and somewhere or another I failed to get it now I think I'm right and if I am right I wish you'd tell me so and then I wish you'd give me that sermon well, he said to me first, you are right. That my spirit, the Holy Spirit, has endeavored to get over to your spirit another sermon along that line, but you failed to pick it up. But he said, while I'm here, I'll do what you ask. I'll give you that sermon outline. Now get your pencil and paper and write it down. And I'll tell you, I started snatching and grabbing into her and actually wrote it down with my eyes shut. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I usually keep paper or pencil or something handy because God talks to me sometimes, well, many times. Amen. And if you don't put things down, sometimes you let them get away from you. All preachers know that and some lay members. Well, anyway, he said write down one, two, three, four. I wrote down one, two, three, four. So I knew I had four points. Now then, he said before he ever began to give them to me, if anybody anywhere, he said, will take these four steps or will put these four principles into operation, they will always receive whatever they want from me or from God the Father. Now, I need to do a little explaining here because sometimes these are four steps that can be taken immediately and you can receive now. For instance, you could take the four steps to salvation, to healing, to the baptism of the Holy Ghost or to victory and receive at this moment. But you see, there are some things that it takes time for them to develop. For instance, if it's a financial need and you're expecting so much money by the first of the year, then they become principles that you have to put into practice over the period of the next two and a half months. Or as in the case of church work, of building Sunday school and, uh, and progressing, you see, that's progressive. And so they become principles that have to be put into operation over a period of time. But thank God whether they are steps to be taken immediately or whether they are principles to be practiced over a period of time, you can have whatever you want or you can write your own ticket with God. I took my own cue from what he said and put my own title to my sermon, How to Write Your Own Ticket with God. 
Step number one. And I'll tell you, it's so simple, every one of them, that it seems foolish almost. But after all, Jesus, in all of his preaching, never did bring out anything very complicated. Did you notice that? He talked in terms that the, even the uneducated could understand it. Amen. He talked about uh, vineyards. Amen. And orchards and, and sheepfold and shepherds and so on. Isn't that true? And illustrated spiritual verities in such a simple way that the common people, because the people he preached to really didn't have the advantages of education that we have today. You know that. And so really, friends, God never did give anybody anything that was so complicated that it couldn't be understood. If it comes from the Father, it will be clear and concise, praise the Lord, and simple. Step number one, say it. What is the first step that this woman made? What is the first thing that she did? Well, we read it to you. The 28th verse said, For she said, If I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. That's the first thing she did. Now the word said that somebody told her of Jesus, but that's not something she did. That's something someone else did. You see, there is a Godward side and there's a manward side to every battle, to every victory, to everything we receive from God. You have your part to play. There's something you must do. Now God's not going to fail, you know that. If there's any failure, it has to be on our part. And so if we'll see to it that we do our part, we can be sure of an answer and can be sure of the victory. Yes, someone told her about Jesus. That's not something that she did. That's something someone else did. Now, you see, she knows about Jesus. She knows that he's healing people. She knows that he is a healer. Now what's she going to do? What is her first step toward being healed? For she said. Jesus said, step number one, say it. Then in the vision that night, Christ said to me, positive or negative, it is up to you or up to the individual according to what the individual says that shall he receive he said to me this woman could have made a negative statement or confession instead of a positive and that would have been what she would have received he said to me she could have said there's no use for me to go I've suffered so long 12 years I've been sick all the best doctors have given up on my case. I've spent all of my living. I'm nothing better but rather grow worse. I have nothing to live for. I might as well go ahead and die. And he said if that had been what she would have said, that would have been what she would have received. But she did not speak negatively. She spoke positively. She said, for she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. Praise God. And it came to pass, for you can have what you say. You can write your own ticket with God. And the first step in writing your ticket with God is, say it. Now, friends, if you are defeated, let me say this. This is me talking now. Uh, that was what he said to me. I've already given you what he said. I'm going to elaborate a little bit on it myself. If you are defeated, you are defeated with your own lips. You have defeated yourself. You know, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, the sixth chapter and the second verse, Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, or thou art taken captive with the words of thy mouth. If you are defeated, you're defeated with your own lips. One writer put it this way. You said that you could not. And the moment you said it, you were whipped. You said that you did not have faith. And doubt rose up like a giant and bound you. You taught failure and failure held you in bondage. And those words are well put, friends, because it's true. We as believers, as Christians, should never talk defeat. We should never talk failure. 
You talk about your trials. You talk about your difficulties. You talk about your lack of faith. You talk about your lack of money. And faith will shrivel and dry up. But I'll tell you, bless God, if you'll talk about your lovely heavenly Father, if you'll talk about the Word of God, if you'll talk about what He can do, your faith will grow by leaps and bounds. Now, if you confess sickness, it'll develop sickness in your system. If you talk about your doubts and your fears, your doubts and your fears will become stronger and they'll grow. If you confess the lack of finances, it'll stop the money from coming in. Now, that sounds strange. That sounds like a paradox. But it isn't. It's the truth. I have proven that to be true. I have proven that to be true again and again. I remember a number of years ago, uh, in, in fact, way back about 1951, I, I was preaching uh, in, in, the, in the end of 1950 in a certain place, and, and I was dated after Christmas to go to a certain church. Uh, and so I, uh, uh, three nights, I wasn't able to sleep, and the Lord kept talking to me about not going to that place. And I kept arguing with him and said, Now, Lord, uh, I'm supposed to go there next. I'm going home for a few days for Christmas, about a week, and then the first Sunday after Christmas I start a meeting there, and I might misput that, uh, that, that pastor. And, and then uh, the Lord just kept dealing with me, and finally he got down to brass tacks with me, and I said, well, Lord, that's a large church, and it's right here in the wintertime, and they guarantee a man so much. And if more comes in, you get it, you see. But if it doesn't come in, you've got to guarantee you so much anyhow. And it's just pretty easy to coast sometimes, you know. And, and say, Lord, you know, I, I need that money. Uh, because it takes money to go in the wintertime. Expenses are up. And we're going through Christmas time. We're going to spend more. But anyway, he said, no, I don't want you to go there. And finally, I said the third night, all right, Lord, I'll call that pastor tomorrow. And I'll tell him what you told me. And if he'll let me off the hook... I won't go there. But if he insists, I'll keep my word and go on. For one of the characteristics of a spiritual pilgrim is he that swears to his own hurt and changes not. And so the next day, I put it off just as long as I could. And finally, just after 6 o'clock in the evening, of course, it'd be a little cheaper to phone in anyhow, I was staying in the Parsons and asked the pastor if I could make a long-distance call and I'd pay him. And so just as I started to pick up the phone at about five minutes past six, the phone rang. And so I picked it up and said, such and such a postage. And they said, there's a long distance call here for Reverend Kenneth Hagin. And I said, this is he. And it so happened that that was that pastor calling me. And so I said, well, brother, praise God, I'm glad you called. I'm just about to call you, so you saved me a long distance telephone call. You can pay for it. And uh, he said, what are you going to call me for? Well, I said, uh, uh, you tell me first what you're calling me about. After all, you got through first. Well, he said, you're coming on to me, aren't you, here when you get through there after you go home about a week for Christmas? Yeah, well, I said, I plan to. Well, he said, I'll tell you what I'm calling about, Brother Hagin. He said, uh, now, I'll be here on Sunday, all right, when we start the meeting off. But he said, I'm going to have to be gone about five days during the week. I've been called away, and uh, some business is coming up, and I have to go to Kansas City, Missouri. And he said, I'll have to be gone for five days, but I'll be back on the next weekend, and I want you to come on now, and you can just carry it on. There'll be someone here to take charge of the service and so on. Well, I said to him, Brother, I'll tell you what I was going to call you about. I know you're a man of God. You believe in being led of the Spirit. And I said, The Lord's been talking to me the last three nights and told me not to come there at this time. And I said, I just thought I'd phone you, and if you say, Come on, I'll come on. I'll keep my word. I wouldn't want to misput you on this short of notice. Oh, brother, he said, that suits me fine. I didn't want to misput you on this short notice. I really need to be gone two weeks, and so I'll just go ahead and take the two weeks off and get this business tended to. He said, you will come to me later on, won't you? I said, I will when the Lord says so. And it was two years before he said go. I eventually got back. But anyway, he said, well, all right, whenever the Lord speaks to you, you let me know, and, and we'll plan the meeting. And he said, no, that's fine. I was just uh, fearful that I would misput you on such a short note. I said, don't bother about me. I got plenty of places to go, plenty of doors open, and, uh, and uh, it won't misput me at all. And so I hung up. Then I said, now, Lord, where do you want me to go? <laughs> you know, he just leads you one step at a time. 
If you want to get the whole picture before you make a move, then you'll never make a move and miss the whole business. I had to cancel out on that one before I could get the next direction. <laughs> well, you see, I was just sure. I, I said, now, Lord, I guess you want me to call Brother so-and-so in such and such a place. You know, I'm trying to tell him, you know, just what to do. Because he had phoned me and had written me and had sent me a telegram and had talked to me personally. And he said, we're averaging 300 in Sunday school. And we've just got a new auditorium built that will seat 800 people. And if you'll come, we'll guarantee you a full house every night. Well, you get 800 people together, you don't have any trouble getting an offering, you know. That many folks. And it's winter time. <laughs> and so I said, I guess you want me to call him. He just said, call me, collect any time, and we'll start. Yeah, I'm sure you want me to call him, don't you? And go there. No, he said, I don't want you to call him. Well, I said, Lord, where do you want me to go? And you know what he told me? He sent me off to a little old church away down in East Texas, right close to the Louisiana border, way out in the country. <laughs> that just run 70 in Sunday school. And that was the top for him. Anywhere from 40 to 70. 70 is the top. I said to him, Lord, do you know what you're talking about? Now, some folks, they, they, they get excited, but I talk to the Lord just like I do anybody else. I'm closer to him now than anybody else. Praise the Lord. He knows anyhow. He knows what you think. You might as well tell it. I said, Lord, you know what you're talking Are you sure? Well, I said, Lord, I can't afford to go down there. You know how much money it takes for me to get by. And that little old church can't meet my budget. In fact, the pastor that's there, I held him a meeting one time at another place, a little old country church, and he gave me a dollar ninety-nine cents a week. <laughs> he did. I mean, that's what I got. He got up on Sunday night on the time he took up an offering and said, Well, Brother Hagin's been here a week now. This received my offering and said, I've got a few coppers. You know, a copper's a penny. Maybe you have, and I think they all took him at his word, and they had about 199, so they all gave a penny apiece. <laughs> And I gave it back to him each week. I gave it back to him. I decided if they was that short, they needed more than I did. And went off without anything. Amen. And I said, Lord, that fellow don't even know how to take up an offering. And I can't afford to go down there. Well, he said, that's why I want you to go. Well, I said, all right, all right, all right, I'll go. But I said, I'll tell you one thing now. I'm going to expect you to meet my budget just like you do when I'm in the city and in the larger churches. Well, he said, you do the going and I'll do the doing. And I said, all right. Well, I got a hold of that fellow and told him what the Lord told me because he had written in it anyway and said to him, if the Lord ever led me, and I found out later they'd been praying for two weeks in their church and I would come. And so I went home Christmas and then I went down there to start with him on the first Sunday after Christmas. And so I drove all, all Sunday afternoon to get there, and right close to church time, I, I'll tell you, way out in the country, looks like, you know, down there in all those pine trees, looks like you're getting, getting to the jumping off place almost before you got there. I'll tell you, naturally speaking, it looked like you'd have missed a thousand miles. And so I drove up, and I said to him, that, well, I hadn't hardly got inside the house till he said, Brother Aiken, I come very near calling you uh, and telling you not to come. He said, you know, we, ha we had a... A crop, a, a crop failure here. We're out here in the country and said our two main main crops are tomatoes and cotton. And the hail got the tomatoes and the drought got the cotton. <laughs> we had a tomato crop failure and we had a cotton crop failure and we can't promise you a dime. <laughs> well, I said, I didn't ask you for a dime, did I? He said, no. Well, I said, Brother Robinson, I'm only, Ben, as you raised the subject, I never mentioned it, but Ben, as you mentioned the subject, would you mind if I said something? No, he said, say anything you want. Well, I said, for goodness sake, don't get up there and tell the people, that I know you had a cotton crop failure, you had a tomato crop failure, you can't give anything because you just got through telling them not to give. Now, if you're going to say anything, get up and tell them what the Bible says. Tell them that the Bible, God said, the 50th Psalm, the world and the fullness thereof is the Lord's. Tell them that the Bible said the silver and the gold. 
The cattle of a thousand hills is the Lord's. And what belongs to the Lord belongs to us. And we're all well able to give. We're going to take up the offering now. I said, I don't ask you to make a pool. Just pass the plate and give them a chance to give. And I told the Lord, I said, now, Lord, I'm claiming so much money. I, I figured I'd just pare it down to a minimum, you see. And, and I said, the least that I can possibly make it on is $150 a week. And I'm expecting that. I can't get by on less at that time. And so he said, and so I didn't tell the pastor that. I told the Lord that I knew he'd been scared. So he, I, I didn't expect him to do it just verbally, but anyway, he just took me what I said and told him word for word. Not that he didn't tell him Brother Hagin told him, but just said the word says it. And we're going to take up the offering now. Well, after I preached that two or three nights, uh, the Lord said to me, I just want you to stay ten days. So you see, I started on Sunday, went through the following Sunday, started on Sunday, and I went to preach through the following Sunday, and then Tuesday night was my last night, which made ten nights. We preached right on through Saturday night, too. And I started another meeting not too far from there from the larger church on Wednesday night. And so I said, all right, Lord, then I'm going to claim $200, because I'm going on to the larger church, $200 for this 10 nights, it'll take that to barely meet me. In fact, I'll just barely get by. I'm going to trim it down as low as I can. So, he just passed the plate. When the 10 nights was over, I had $248.15. Then on Sunday, well, first, in that meeting, when I got there, he just had one man in his church. One man. We had 32 people come to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Out of 32, 29 of them received the minute I laid my hands on them. Out of the 29, there were 12, 13 grown men. Out of the 13 men, 12 of them were heads of families. And he had 12 heads of families in his church with the 10 days time that he'd ever had before. Praise God. He said, I wouldn't have believed it. We had a tomato crop failure. We had a cop crop failure. <laughs> but he said, you proved your point to me, brother. I'll never talk failure anymore. <laughs> yes, sir. You talk about the lack of finances and it stops the money from coming in. You talk of your doubts and fears and you destroy your faith. Now, hold fast. Bless God to the right confession. Praise the Lord. She said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. Step number two, do it. Step number one, say it. Step number two, do it. You see, it wouldn't have done her any good to have said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole, if she had to act it on what she said. Now, Jesus said to me, and I wrote it down, I have it just as I wrote it that night, your actions or action defeat you or it puts you over. According to your action you receive, or you are kept from receiving. That's important. That's important. Let me read it again. Your action defeats you, or puts you over. According to your action you receive, or you are kept from receiving. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And then she acted on that. She did it. Praise God. And she received. Step number three, receive it. Receive it. Say it. Do it. Receive it. She felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Jesus said, virtue has gone out of me. Somebody's touched me. Or as the margin of the King James translation reads, he said, power has gone out of me. The disciples said, Lord, the multitude throngeth thee, and sayest thou, somebody touched me. I want you to notice something, though. She said it first. She came for it second. And then she received it and felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. Notice that the feeling and the healing followed the coming and the doing. Now most folks want the feeling and the healing first and then they think they'll have the saying and the doing, but you can't. 
You've got to have the saying and the action first. And then you'll have the healing and the feeling. Praise God. Now Jesus said, power has gone out to me. Power has gone out to me. Jesus, at that time, was the only representative of the Godhead that was at work within the earth. And he was anointed by the Holy Ghost. If you wanted to get where the power was, you'd have to get where he was. In the fifth chapter of Luke, the 17th verse, the Bible said he was in such and such a house teaching. And they were gathered together, scribes and Pharisees and doctors of the law from throughout Judea to hear him teach. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now he delegated a certain amount of that power to the twelve and sent them out, and then unto the seventy and sent them out. But Jesus went away. And he said, it's expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. And when he got back to heaven, then he sent the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost, to this earth. And the Holy Spirit is the only person of the Godhead that's at work within the earth tonight. Now Jesus said to me, power is always present everywhere. You see, if you wanted to get where the power was then, you had to get where Jesus was. But Jesus said to me, power is always present everywhere. Oh, if folks could only realize that. Thank God the Holy Ghost is not here in, only here in Tulsa. He's over in Oklahoma City tonight. He's not only here in Oklahoma, but he's down in Texas. He's not only in Texas, but he's over in Arkansas. He's not only there, but he's out in California. He's not only here in America, but he's down in Mexico. He's everywhere present. And wherever he is, there's power. Now, you know, my friends, the whole world had become concerned about the nuclear bombs that had been exploded in the atmosphere because... Those instruments release radioactive material in the atmosphere. Power that cannot be seen. Power that cannot be felt. But power that is deadly and dangerous. Isn't that true? I want to tell you, bless God, there's a power at work within this earth tonight that is not deadly or dangerous. But there is a power, bless the Lord, that's good that heals, that delivers, that sets free. And that power is present, always present, everywhere. If all of the sick people knew it, here in Tulsa, not only in Tulsa, but in every city in Oklahoma, not only in Oklahoma, but every city of the nation and of the world, in every sick room and every hospital, there is unseen and unheard power in that room. If they just knew it and just knew how to tap into it, they would heal them of every disease. There's power to deliver from every sickness. There's power to deliver from every demon and from everything that binds or hurts or destroys everywhere present. You know, just like in those rooms, there is an electric outlet you can plug into that. There's unseen, there's unheard power in that line. You can plug into that electrical outlet. And you can run a fan. Or anything, any kind of electrical appliance. Here are tape recorders that are plugged into an electrical outlet. This organ is plugged into an electrical outlet. And that electricity, unseen and unheard, flows through. And we enjoy the benefits of it tonight. Praise God. Isn't that true? Somebody said in the modern home, nearly everything is minded by switches except the children. <laughs> and how true. Well, my friends, we 
may know how to plug into that electrical outlet and enjoy the benefits of electricity. But I want you to notice that if we can discover and find out how to plug into that power that's everywhere present, then bless God we can be healed. We can put that power to work for us. And I want you to know, my friends, that it's not any secret, that is, it's not a hidden secret. It may be a secret to some, but it's revealed to us and to all who will listen. Daughter, Jesus said, Thy faith hath made thee whole. It was her faith that caused that power to flow out to her. Jesus said to me, power is always present everywhere. Now listen to what he said, and it's true. Faith gives it action, or puts it to work, or uses it. Now we know the secret. Jesus said, somebody touch me. The disciples said, the multitude throng of thee, and sayest thou, somebody touch me. No telling how many people touched it. Some through curiosity. Many accidentally pushed up against him. Some just to see if anything would happen, but nothing happened. No power flowed until there came the touch of faith. And the minute there was a touch of faith, then that power flowed out. Can you see it? Many are waiting for something to come to them, and it's there all the time. That's the very first step. Recognize that God's power is here present. Many have died waiting for healing to come to them, saying, I believe God's going to heal me sometime. That is an unscriptural statement, and there is no faith to that. That won't work. I said that won't work. Many have said, I'm going to get the Holy Ghost sometime. No, you won't, not as long as you talk like that. Because, you see, you can have what you say, and you are saying that it's going to work sometime, and sometime never comes. Are you hearing me? But bless God, you can plug in now. You can receive God's power now. It's not a matter of God doing anything. He's already done all he's going to do about it. It's up to you to do something about it. I've had people come to me and say, Brother Hagin, will you, can you tell me, do you know why the Lord won't heal me? And sometimes I shock them by saying, Sister, God's already done all he's ever going to do about healing you. Their eyes are getting, you mean he's not going to heal me? I said, I didn't say that. I said he's done all he's ever going to do about healing you. You see, he sent Jesus nearly 2,000 years ago, and he laid your sickness and your disease on Jesus, and Jesus bore it away. Himself took your infirmities and bare your sicknesses. God's already done something about your sicknesses. Why won't you accept what he's done? But you see, that puts responsibility on me. We want to put the responsibility on God. Well, I've had him to mumble and grumble and gripe and fuss and go away saying, well, I believe he's going to do it sometime, but he isn't. And I said with tears, some of those that said that are dead now, they're dead. I knew they wouldn't. I told them they wouldn't receive. Not under those circumstances. God's not going to do anything about it. Thank God he's done something about it. Salvation. The Holy Ghost. Healing and demons. Praise God, he's done something about it. Already. It's up to us to plug in. <laughs> Praise the Lord, isn't that right? Faith is the plug. Praise God. Just plug in tonight. Praise the Lord. How do I plug in? First thing, say it. Say it. Step number four. Tell it. She came and fell down before him and told him. Not only him, but the whole crowd heard it. Told him all the truth. Jesus said, tell it so that others may believe it or receive it. Now you see, there's a little, there's a difference in the first and the last point. The first is say it, the last is tell it. She, she said what she believed, she told what had happened. You have to say some things in faith, brother, to ever receive from God. 
And you know why people say the wrong thing? Because they believe the wrong thing. And as long as they say it and believe it, that's what they'll have. But when they start believing the right thing and saying the right thing, that's what they'll have. So in the vision I said to the Lord, Lord, I can see that. I can see if we'd take those, anyone take those four steps, they'll receive healing just like that woman did. But now, you said if anybody anywhere would take those four steps they'd receive from you whatever they wanted, do you mean that folks can receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost that way? He said, most assuredly, yes. And thank God I've seen many come just that way and receive. Then I said to him, now Lord, what about Christians? So many believers. I've heard them testify and say, pray for me. They need victory along this line, that line and the other. We have the world, the flesh, and the devil to deal with. And so many times, some folks need victory over the flesh. Some people need victory over the devil. Some people need victory over the world. Some people need victory over all of them. I need believers. Now I said, are you telling me then that any believer anywhere can write a ticket of victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil, they can do it? He said emphatically, yes. And he said, if they don't do it, it won't be done. They'll be wasting their time to pray that I would give them the victory. They'll have to write their own ticket. But I said, Lord, you're going to have to give me some more scripture to prove it now. Because I said, your, your word says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So give me some more scripture that, that has those same four principles there, and I'll believe it. No, he didn't reprimand me. He smiled and said, all right. Why, he said the story from the word of God, the Old Testament, that you've known from you, actually from a baby. As far as you know, you do it all your life. Well, I said, I don't know where it is. You'll have to tell me. He said, why in the first Samuel, the 17th chapter, the story of David and Goliath, I said, wait a minute, you're not going to tell me that that's what David did. He said, that's exactly, those are the four steps he made. The very first thing David did, he said. And you can read it for yourself. I read it after the vision, and five times he said it before he acted on it. First, David was sent by his daddy with some provisions for the boys in the service and see how the war was going. When he got there, he found the, Ill the Philistines encamped on one side, of the valley and the Israelites on the other. And while he was there, there was a giant that came out by the name of Goliath. And he challenged the armies of Israel and said, send the men out against me. And if I defeat him, you'll be our servants. And if he defeats me, we'll be your servants. Now then, and David said, and David said, and David said, praise God, that's the first thing he did. And David said, I will go against that uncircumcised Philistine. Now someone told King Saul. Saul called David, and David said, read it again, and David said, this is the second time he said it. And David said, I'll go against him. I was watching my father's sheep, and a bear came, and a lion came, and took a kid from the flock. And by my God, I slew the lion, and I slew the bear, and the Lord will deliver this Philistine into my hand. Now somebody said, now just watch scripture with David standing on none. He just knew you could have what you say. He just knew you could write your own ticket. He's writing it. He just knew, well, how did he know God to do it? He knew God to do anything he'd believe in for, and he will for you too. And the reason he hadn't done it anymore is because you haven't believed him for anymore. In fact, all you are and all you have today, men and women, is a result of what you believed and said yesterday. I don't mean just yesterday, Saturday, but you know, in the past. Amen. And if you're at the bottom of the ladder, it's because that's all you believe. And that's because all, that's what you said. If you'll start believing rightly and talking rightly, you'll get at the top. Praise God. Now then, well, David, you know, of course, Saul wanted to give him his armor, but he wouldn't take it. And David went out just with his shepherd's sling and his uh, slingshot and sh shepherd crook, or stick, you see. And the Bible said when the giant saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth. And he cursed him by his gods and said, I'll take your head off of your shoulders this day, and so on. 
Well, David, let him talk. You can't stop the devil from talking. Let him blab. But when he gets through, you have something to say. Jesus didn't stop the devil from talking. He came to him. But when he got through, he had something to say. He said, it's written. <laughs> and David said, he's still right that ticket. And David said, thou comest against me with sword and shield and spear. But I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. And he's not through yet. And David said, I'll take your head off of your shoulders this day. And he's not through yet. And he said, I will feed your carcass and the carcasses of the hosts of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the field this day. In other words, he said, I don't want to whip you, I'm going to whip the whole bunch of you. <laughs> Praise God. How could that little old 17-year-old country boy Yes, sir. Not a soldier. He'd never been trained to fight. Here's a giant. Goliath. The Bible tells how many cubits high he has. He was, according to Flo Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian, a cubit was measured a different length in Israel's history. If you measured by the longer length, he was 11 and a half feet tall. If you measured by the lesser one, he was 9 feet and 10 inches. He, he couldn't have been less than nine feet, ten inches tall. You wouldn't hardly call him shorty, would you? <laughs> he was so big another man carried his sheep. Amen. Now someone said, how did David know what God to do? You know, I hear people, God bless their lovely little hearts. They think they're being humble and don't know they're being ignorant. <laughs> I hear people say, you can't never tell what may happen. You can't tell what God will do. Yes, brother, you'll do everything you said you'd do, and you'll do everything you believe him to do. Are you hearing me? You can write your ticket. Then people, they think they're being humble, don't know they're being ignorant. Well, I don't know what I might do. Isn't it strange? When it comes to the natural, folks know exactly what they might do and what they can do. If you've got a house for rent, you know exactly how much you want for it. If you got an automobile for sale, you know exactly what you can sell it for. If you're hiring out for a job, you know exactly what you can do. But when it comes to spiritual things, I don't know what I can do. Yes, bless God, you can. You can write your own ticket. That's what you can do. And whether you know it or not, that's what you've been to doing. I said, that's what you've been to doing. You've been writing your own ticket with God. And that's the reason some are where they are now, in a place of failure. Yes, David said it, he did it. He ran and hastened to meet the giants. He cut his head off. They told the story. The women got their musical instruments and began to shout and dance and said, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. Now Jesus said to me, That giant, Israel, is a type of the people of God. That giant is a type of the devil, the evil spirits, demons, the world, the flesh, anything else that stands between God's people and victory. But every child of God can write a ticket of victory. Oh, glory to God. Praise God. Say it, do it, receive it, tell it. All right, I said, Lord, I can see that. That's scriptural now then. At the beginning of this vision, though, or at the beginning when you first started talking to me, you said, if anybody anywhere will take these four steps, they can always receive whatever they want. Now, what about the sinner? Yes, he said, the thing the sinner needs is salvation. Now, I said, you're not going to tell me that's the way he's saved. He said emphatically, yes. Well, I said, Lord, you're going to have to give me some more scripture. Again, your word set them out the two or three witnesses. And I want scripture from the New Testament this time. Why, he said, scripture that you preached and that others have preached and have been preached to the sinner more than any other scripture in the Bible. Well, I said, dear Jesus, I read the New Testament through 150 times and portions of it more than that. And if there's anything like that in there, I don't know it. He said, son, there's a lot in there you don't know yet. And oh my God, how that is true. How much that's true, even yet. But I said, where is it? Why, he said in the 15th chapter of Luke's gospel, the story of the prodigal son. He said the very first thing the prodigal did. He said... He said, that's the first thing he did. He said, read it for yourself. I didn't believe it was that until I looked at it afterwards. He said, he said, yes, it says when he came to himself, he said, 
Jesus said the preaching of the word shows the sinner himself. He sees himself lost. Now what's he going to do? He said, I know what I'll do. I will arise and go home. And I'll say, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven and no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hard servants. He said it. Second, he did it. You see him climb out of that hog pasture and start down the road toward home. He did it. Third, he received it. The Bible said the father saw him coming afar off. And he ran and met him. And fell on his neck and hugged him and kissed him. And said to bring the robe and put on it. Bring the ring and put on his finger. And shoes and put on his feet. Kill the fatted calf. Oh, hallelujah. And then Jesus said something to me that absolutely upended my theology. He said those people who come to the altar and bawl and squall and cry and beg and pray for me to save them are not down there to get saved. He said they're down there trying to talk themselves in the notion of believing something. He said if they come according to the word of God like the prodigal son, my father will meet them before they ever get to the altar. I've seen him do it. I said I've seen him do it. Yes, it's scriptural. He saw him coming afar off and ran to me. Oh, hallelujah. And I want to tell you, they told it. That elder brother came in from the field and heard them telling it. There was a sound of dancing and music. And he said, what meaneth this? And he, they said, well, your brother's come home. Told him about he got mad, wouldn't go in. The father came out and entreated him. Now get the story. This has to be a picture of the lost. Because the father said, My son that was lost is come. 